What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final final little passes at this is a dead meat. All right. Damien, thank you for joining me for a conversation. Uh, now that Terrifier 3 is out and everyone can go see it and they should go see it. Go see it. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me. It's always good to talk to you. Yeah. I mean, obviously, dude, I, I bet you couldn't have imagined the size and, and uh, scope of this movie back when you were making the first one. It, it must be surreal to see something that was so, you know, homegrown and so independent blossom and boom into what it is now. Uh, very much so, man. It's very surreal. We always tell ourselves and um, we're always kind of like... We'll be at a convention, David and I, Lauren, uh, and you know, we'll catch ourselves every once in a while, just kind of like looking at each other and kind of giggling and being like, <laughs> do you believe this is happening kind of thing? Which is wonderful. You never want that to go away. It, it's such a really magical time for all of us, and it's very surreal. Does It, it, it never quite, quite sinks in, and just seeing people with tattoos and all the like, cosplays and all that kind of stuff. It's really magical. And we never, certainly I never noticed it would get to this level. For sure. Even though I, for a long time ago, you know, created the character in like 2006 for a short film and then made another one a few years later. And it really wasn't until that second short film, which was called Terrifier, that I really felt there was something truly special with the character. Didn't know exactly what it was. Certainly didn't imagine it would go here, but I knew there was something there. And I was always trying to get him into a, a feature. So I'm glad that he really did sort of resonate with a lot of people and he's sort of touching a nerve. But did I ever imagine he was going to be in Call of Duty or uh, <laughs> Halloween costumes? A absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely. Right? Because I know that, you know, you're a fan of horror. I, I, I remember you once described art as like a silent Freddy Krueger type. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when you're talking about Freddy and Jason and Michael, it's like all these icons, it seemed like we kind of tapped out of the ability to make new icons after like the early 90s. I mean, Ghostface kind of penetrated and made a, mm -hmm. a, a name for himself, but like it felt like we were done making these giant, very super recognizable horror killers. And then along comes Art, who just skyrockets to near the top. He got kids dressing as him and like you yeah. said halloween costumes tattoos like everywhere and he's so recognizable that even people who don't watch these movies whether it's because they don't like horror or they they like horror but not this extreme they know the character they recognize him for sure even like children who aren't allowed to watch these movies <laughs> but they just love the image of him like i'll meet a lot of them at horror conventions they come up to the table i'm like have you seen this and they're like no i just and the parents are like they just not yet but they just really like the way he looks and everything yeah um, <laughs> it's great to see that reminds me of when i was a kid and i went to these i mean i didn't go that young but i was a fan since i was that age four or five years old i was watching all of these movies these were my heroes the way other kids you know idolized batman superman not to say i didn't also love those characters but i really had a strong love for the slashers i was the weird horror kid as as a child the kid that the parents were like eh, i don't know if you should be <laughs> out with that kid you know um <laughs> So so it's cool in that regard because, and again, I, I don't call art an icon. I love hearing people say that. I think that word gets thrown around maybe a little too easily. I think you got to, you know, the test of time will really tell. But I do love that people gravitate toward this character so much. And if it did resonate, it's because it really did come from a genuine place, from a genuine fan, a kid who just absolutely consumed these movies from a very young age, all the way up into my adult life until I just sort of transitioned into making horror movies. So I could uh, I could recite all those movies, the Nightmare on Elm Street's one to, you know, seven from beginning to end, Friday the 13th. I could tell you every character's name in those movies. I was like that involved in those films. So I mean, it, it really just came out of a out of a genuine place. So it's just really special, very special to me that I get to like sort of give something back. Yeah. Do you have a favorite random side character from the Friday the Thirteenth franchise? Because once we did a podcast episode ranking all the random like side characters from the whole franchise, and because uh, a lot of them stand out, do you have a favorite? <laughs> Sure, that's a great question. There's a bunch. I mean, it's kind of hard not to choose uh, Crispin Glover from Part Four. <laughs> sure, yeah, that dancing. <laughs> that's so, so fat. He's so quirky. I mean, it's Crispin Glover. So, top of my head, that really stood out. Um, 
I got to say, I love uh, – you got to give props to Shelly from Part 3 for giving uh, Jason – the mask, his... yep. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah I've always been partial to Demon from Part 5, Miguel A. Nunez oh, Jr. Of course. And I'm a huge um, Return of the Living Dead fan. It's one of my yeah. favorite movies ever. So I love love that actor. Um, great character. He's got a, He's got one hell of a scene in there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that obviously – I clocked it right from the trailer. There's a Black Christmas reference in Terrifier mm. 3. It's it's Art sitting in a chair by the window in an attic, and it's, it's very clearly reads Black Christmas to me. I was looking for other references, and the only one that Chelsea and I maybe noticed, and maybe it's a stretch, is uh, Art drives a white van, and it's Christmas time. Was that a reference to Christmas Evil, or is that just a, a happy no, coincidence? It wasn't. That was a happy coincidence. <laughs> Certainly the Black Christmas is blatant homage. Um, of course, the shower massacre is blatant homage to Psycho and actually Scarface, the shower oh. kill in Scarface, okay. uh, which is a chainsaw shower kill, but in a very different you know, sort of context, much more grounded in reality kind of thing. But um, yeah, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's many sort of sprinkled throughout because I'm constantly doing that well, off the top of my head. I can't think of. Uh, oh, there's the shining with the. Uh... Cut yeah. through the door. You know, honestly, though, I mean, I, I guess that was inevitable that that was going to happen. But that was one of those instances where I really set up the axe murder in the intro as an homage to um, the Tales from the Crypt episode and all through the house, which okay. I don't know if you've I've not seen that, no. It, it's my favorite Chris, like a uh, horror Christmas episode to a show. I might even love it more than Black Christmas as a, as a movie. It's, it's that good. It was made for the... Tales from the Crypt movie from the 70s, the UK version. Mm -hmm. It was an anthology, five short stories. And it's this maniac, uh, this escape mental patient who dons a Santa costume. And the whole time he's trying to break into this house and murder this woman with an axe. And that, to me, that's the ultimate iteration of the maniac Santa Claus. And then years later, Robert Zemeckis remade it for the uh, the TV show in the 90s. And it's the best episode. Um, so that was like the whole reason that really got me fired up to turn this into a Christmas-based horror film. It was that short film, that episode from Tales from the Crypt, really, where I was like, hmm, I'd like to take my stab at the maniac Santa Claus. So it was really just inevitably, he's going to be chasing this woman with an axe. She's going to be behind the door. Axe comes through. And then when we did that, I mean, it was like a no-brainer to have Dave put his face, you know, into the into the crack. So it was like the Shining reference had to happen. But uh, that was more on the spot than actually planning to, to do that one. Okay. I, I yeah. just appreciate the restraint of not doing the, like, the camera camera panning with the axe swing from the side profile view into the door that yeah, gets yeah, used yeah. a lot <laughs> it does. and it's beautiful i mean it is it, it's like everyone wants to do it because it's such a cool yeah. shot <laughs> yeah and you're never going to do it as well <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i mean obviously you are paying respect to horror films another way by casting a whole bunch of iconic character actors and actors who have played in the genre for for a long time uh daniel roebuck is so awesome as Santa. It's it's maybe my favorite scene. He's so funny, especially since he's right there alongside Clint Howard, uh, yeah. who is in so many films. But like Ice Cream Man has always been a favorite of mine since I was a kid. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. No, great to see them there. He's so good. They both were so incredible. And uh, especially Daniel, he, he improvised so much. So many of those lines he just made up on the spot, like really great lines. Like, you know, we're in the same business. We make people laugh, all that kind of stuff. All the stuff about Elvis. He was just having a blast with that character. And I was just sitting back like, this is fantastic. You're just, just elevating this material to another level. And that was the, the hardest I ever laughed, I would say. Uh, aside from... Terrifier one, Art the Clown, uh, David riding the little bicycle, like in the middle <laughs> yeah. of the night, shooting that, like, and I was just delirious and laughing my ass off. I would say the bar scene with Roebuck in in uh, part three was the hardest I ever laughed on set, just watching them play off of each other. It was really cool. Well, I think that something that these movies don't get enough credit for, especially two and three, uh, is that these characters, a lot of them are are really likable, and it's it's like. Daniel Roebuck there is is so funny and enjoyable, and he's like a nice guy up yeah. until Art, you know, pisses him off, which is understandable. And uh, it kind of reminds me of like the costume store clerk in Terrifier <laughs> Two. He was yeah. such uh, it, it, these these characters get a little bit of screen time, but because of their performance, they just seem like really nice people. And in this one, you did another thing that you did in Terrifier Two with her uh, party friend who I forget the name of, but she sees her, her corpse here. 
Brooke. Brooke, yeah. yeah. Brooke is the type of character that you expect to be like a mean girl and just like an unlikable character, but she's not. She's a really enjoyable, nice person who you like right. watching. And in Terrifier 3, you do the same thing with Jonathan's college roommate. The, mm -hmm. He walks in on him making out with a chick, and I'm like, oh, okay, we got the douchey, like, college friend. No, right. he's a really likable guy who, like, guy. defends yeah. his buddy. And I just, li I, I feel like that's, that goes underreported in these films, that these characters are actually likable. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, because I want you to feel something when they're getting killed and not really rooting for them to die, because inevitably you're rooting for Art the Clown to kill people. Like, Art's the hero of the movie. But um, I think it's just so much more powerful when you can empathize or sympathize with these with these characters it makes the it makes the kill scene so much more despicable yeah and i always want art to be to be a despicable character sadistic character even when we're making him do the funniest things like we have those conversations on set all the time and i always remind everybody as far as we you know we'll push it as far as we can uh with the levity and get the audience to have fun with this character because that's super important but at the end of the day it's essential that he remains ultimately sadistic evil cruel unpredictable uh and that was one of the reasons why i wanted this cold open at the beginning of part three because i wanted to reintroduce the audience to art the clown as if they never met him before like you might be the biggest fan and you're coming just to see him kill people and joke but i'm like mm, what if we really kick this off the darkest most disturbing way possible just to remind you that you can't trust this character and we'll always try and you know dive into his darker side if we can just to always remember where we came from and why this character worked in the first place yeah i think it's very effective in that regard because I'm thinking like, you know, by the time you get to Freddy's Dead, the final nightmare, he's he's a cartoon character. He's like lovable Fred. Oh, ho, ho, ho. and with Terrifier, I could see that happening, especially with how beloved Art is. But yeah. I don't think it's until that that bar scene with Daniel Roebuck that you get art shenanigans where you're laughing along with him and he's doing the mime yeah. stuff. Because, yeah, that that opening scene is his he's not being that funny. He's just being. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that, and it's tricky because laughter, getting laughs from the audience is addictive. It's it's really cool to have be in an audience and you just hear howling laughter. And I feel like, I feel like that's something that Tarantino got addicted to because his movies get consistently funnier and funnier, but not to a, a fault. But mm -hmm. I mean, if you compare something like uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood to say Reservoir Dogs, you know, like it is just you, you think you're basically watching a comedy by the time you get to his later movies. Like, there's a, so many laughs in them. And I think he really got addicted to the laughs from the audience because you're just getting these audible these audible responses. It kind of like, it's like a shot of adrenaline. It's like an immediate response from the audience. So I understand that, but I have to remind myself that that's not what these movies are, you know? And I never, I never even imagined these movies to become that funny. Um, I love... Uh, horror comedies like we talked about return of the living dead even like evil dead 2 you get a lot of laughs out of them but like evil dead 2 strikes sort of like or for me a, a perfect balance where it walks both lines beautifully it knows when to be serious it knows when to be scary it knows when to get the laughs you know but you could really to me army of darkness went way too far into the to the comedy and the stick yeah yeah um, which is great. It's everybody's got different taste. But for me, you know, there's a there's a balance that I'm always going to try and remind myself to to strike or if anything, lean more into the darkness than go into the, the comedy. That makes sense that Evil Dead 2 is is a movie that you cite since that also relies heavily on the physical performance of its lead from yeah. Bruce Campbell because David is doing so much with his body and expressions oh, yeah. and everything. It, it seems like a mirror image. And they Absolutely. both they're both kind of like in the Jim Carrey sphere of uh just like rubber band yeah. bodies and big faces. Very much. I love that. I love yeah. that. Have, have you had the chance to meet Bruce? I think not no, not I may have gotten to say like hello to him in passing, but never at a con did we ever get to like sit down and really and I get to tell him how much of a you know a, a fan I am and yeah, me yeah. Ne me neither because whenever he goes to cons, he is royalty, man. Those lines are out yeah. the door and it's just like okay, everyone else's intake just got a little lesser because people are yeah, waiting for Bruce. <laughs> for sure, man. And I'm such a fan where I don't know, like it was, I hope it doesn't, but sometimes it might even seem like I'm like standoffish, but I'm more like um sometimes I get nervous around people that I admire and I, I, I don't want to have a bad experience. I, I'm afraid like it, it might tarnish. Like I, sometimes you hear things not about him, but you just might, might hear something like, ah, he's a bit of a dick or she's, a, you know, and it's like, oh, if that tarnishes my movie that I love <laughs> and I watch like twice a year, that's going to kill me. So right, that'd be, that'd be so I'm very careful with meeting uh, people that I admire. Yeah.
Were there any horror actors, uh, well-known people that you, you wanted to get in the movie that you weren't able to, or anyone who you're planning on future movies, maybe? Yeah, there are a bunch of them. I mean, I'd rather a lot of uh, actors that we run into at these cons, we become very friendly with, and they would love to work with us. We would love to work with them. Uh, but it gets to the point where I don't want to just pack out the movie with cameos, for one thing, just for the sake of cameos. And also... I could take an actor and give him a cameo, but then they're sort of baked into the universe in this little moment when perhaps in the next movie, I could have a much juicier, meatier role for them that they'd be so much better at. So it's really just comes down to um, just waiting for the right role for some of these people. So I have a list of people that I'd really like to work with, and I'm just trying to find the right spot to, to, to you know, where they, they're going to fit and they could actually show off their skills as an actor you know yeah i'm glad that you got to work with chrissy for this one who plays the mom in the opening scene she's a good personal friend of mine who i, I love, love and yeah she just had her film little bites that really showcases her talents as an actor she and was she was a favorite on the set just uh, for uh, actor wise just like how talented she is and just what an amazing person she is like nobody wanted her to leave because that was a, again that was like it's a little film within a film yeah the, the opening scene a separate movie yeah it's a nice 10 minute block so we filmed that for maybe five days or so and uh i just yeah i really wanted to give her this i wanted to get her into this universe because i knew it would be good exposure and i knew how talented she was too and i just like i couldn't wait to work with her on this because so many more people should see how talented she is and she should be in so many more things so um i, I mean and to really kick off the movie the way she did. I mean, nobody's topping her screams, that's for sure. I used Dude. her scream like 30 times throughout the rest of the movie. I was putting it in other actresses' mouths. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, my God. I'm putting it everywhere. She's so good. She's yeah, so I good. literally texted her when the scene was done. I was like, Dude, your screaming is so good. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. she's phenomenal. Yeah. To get a little bit more spoilery, not full on spoil, but uh, in this film, you have a character who does like a crime, a true crime podcast. Mm. And so that's an element makes sense since that's such a prominent thing nowadays. And it had been touched upon uh, last movie with Jonathan when he was researching stuff with the Miles County clown. Did you take any inspiration from any real life incidents or real life serial killers in any aspect of this with what Art did or any of the 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 murders or do you kind of try to stay away from that and just make your own stuff uh fiction? No, inevitably sometimes um real life works its way into these movies because something will like disturb me uh or something I may have heard when I was a kid about a real serial killer and it's always there and then I just need to sort of express it somehow or just put it in the movie somehow like i did that i did that a few things times through through terrifier with the um, man the manson murders and if, if i ever put like pig or something in the movie on the wall that's a reference to like okay. Hel helter skelter uh the the image of uh the the bedroom scene the entire bedroom scene uh in part two is based upon a picture i saw an actual crime scene photograph of jack the ripper's victim Oh, geez. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I figured, yeah, you knew that. No, yeah, I was just... I probably learned it at one point and then forgot, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Flipping through a book on Jack the Ripper, and I saw this crime scene photo of, uh, I think, his last victim. And it was horrible. And all you saw was the remains of this woman, and it was just bone and flesh and meat and, like, bloody sheets. You couldn't even really see her. And I was like, oh, my God. And then I, immediately I just go into my horror screenwriting terrifier mode, and I say, what if Art the Clown was responsible for that? And um, what unfolded to get to this, you know, image. And it was just sort of reverse engineering that kill. And it, it felt a little more, a little more palatable, not palatable. That's not the right word. But I mean, like, I felt like I had more of a past because I don't, it's so sensitive to deal with real events. Yeah. But I feel like Jack the Ripper was so long ago. It feels like mythology at this point. It feels like it never really happened. So it was just something, it was just something I just went with. Um but yeah, a lot of times the reality works its way into into these movies. Um, but typically, like in this one with the shower scene, it was more paying homage to Psycho. Mm -hmm. was, uh, well, what if Alfred Hitchcock was able to do that today? Would he be a lot more graphic with the with the murder? I said, if I was given the opportunity to create that kill scene, I would show everything that knife could possibly do to the human <laughs> body. Uh, and I know no one's going to give me the opportunity to remake Psycho, so I'm going to make my own kill scene in the shower. <laughs> So sometimes a kill will just happen that way. You never know when inspiration is going to hit you or where these kill scenes are going to come from. It's, it's yeah, interesting. Yeah, and 
And I, I saw Jason Baker was credited as special effects yeah. supervisor. So uh, when it came to like the kills, was that something that you collaborated with him? Because I know that you did the special effects for the first two films. Yeah. So the primary mega bars on this movie was uh, Christian Tinsley. So okay. Chris, Christian Tinsley worked on Passion of the Christ, uh, oh. No Country for Old Men, Renfield, Westworld, and A Season of American Horror Story. Like he's an Oscar winner, Emmy winner, insane. I, wow. I still can't believe he worked on this movie. Um, so his his crew built everything, and they um, and then he had two of his team members come to set every day to apply the makeup and execute the effects. Uh, Jason worked on a, a special sequence in the film um well we could talk about this now like he primarily did that dream sequence with the the uh he's called the ironclad demon that you see in the trailer like yes uh, you know forging steel it looks like and, a gimp blacksmith <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly that's what i should have named him <laughs> <laughs> so J jason he he uh i designed the creature but jason uh created it he created the mask and uh him and his team they did the body and uh, i they, they also worked on the clothing of the statue of Mary that's uh, also in that image. Dude, that looks so good. That statue moves, and Chelsea and I were like, wait, what? Like, it looks yeah. like a statue, and then it moves, and you're like, oh, that's that's like a, an effect. That's like a costume. Yeah, it's exactly. So they had a, yeah, it was, I don't know how, it was like real material that then they coated in some sort of resin to make it look stiff. And then the actress, uh, Juliana, uh, she, I mean, we did, there's no like camera trickery or speeding up the camera or anything like that. That is actually her doing that sort of, uh, coming to life, that stone robotic movement when it comes to life super talented and then this is amazing too the person who sculpted the mary face is john caglione who's academy award-winning makeup artist on dick tracy oh that's uh, right yeah he's worked on a million movies he's like al pacino's main makeup artist he did the heath ledger how did i forget this the heath ledger joker makeup that's right yeah, yeah. i know he's done horror movies before i can't remember which but i remember talking about him on a kill count and being like this guy made the the, the joker makeup like oh, it's yeah. insane oh, like, insane and so i got to work with him and he was he wow. was dying to work with me and uh, we just like connected through instagram and he was telling me he was a big fan and if there was ever a way we could work together. I was like, is there ever a way we could work together? I'm like, what <laughs> world am I living in right now? Uh, so like they they uh, tackled that sequence. And then Jason, though, also did a lot of other little things throughout the movie. He he created the chainsaws. We needed prop chainsaws. Like he did so many cool things that we needed in a pinch, like making weapons and props. Like Jason's amazing. So um, it was a great, great team that I had. Uh, that I could just rely on and I didn't have to create all the effects myself. Typically it's just me and my partner, Phil Falcone yep. do all the makeup effects. Um, and that's one of the reasons why part two took years because we would have to just stop production, go in his basement, build effects, go back, shoot them as long as we could until we didn't have any effects left. And we'd go back and it was crazy. No way to make a movie. So this was, this was great. This enabled me to work with my actors, work with the production design, the camera department, um, other you know areas where I was spread really thin on the other films because the makeup is so intense and intensive. So yeah, so like was, even in Terrifier two, you were even doing arts like clown makeup, right? Applying that. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It hurts because you're the first person on set because his makeup could take anywhere from two to three hours, and then he's the last person because everybody goes home. You wrap, and then it takes an hour to get his makeup off. Um, and then throughout the day, depending on what the gags are, you know, I'm setting up arms that have to be chopped off and then running to the camera department saying, all right, like set, put the camera here and then working with my actors. And it's just, it's, it's a really, <laughs> it's, it's not a good way to make a movie, but it's the way we had to do it. Cause we just never had the money. So yeah. you do everything you can to make it work. Did you do any of the special effects this time around or were you just kind of like there to, you know, yeah, supervise I, or exactly. I definitely supervise. I was very, um, very involved with how these effects were designed and how they were going to be executed because I would storyboard everything down to it, you know, to a T. So we knew what exactly what had to be built, what was going to be shown. And then I still can't keep my hands off. So if you yeah. see a lot behind the scenes, <laughs> I'm still I'm still in there putting blood on everything. And uh, I, I maybe like one or two days I had to apply arts makeup because the other guys on set were just so busy with the Victoria makeup and maybe setting yeah. up dummies and stuff. So um, anywhere I could sort of pitch in and help, I I did. So it was still it was still fun. I still had to get my hands bloody. 
Yeah, sounded like, yeah, you were delegating a, a bit more this time through. Absolutely. I forget, did you have an editor for this one or did you also edit it yourself? No, I still edited okay. still edit myself. I had, um, I had an assistant editor who um, he basically did like the first pass of a, of like a the assembly? couple of scenes, like a little bit of an, an assembly. And also my buddy, uh, the DP, George, he's an editor as well. I think he assembled a couple of scenes. Uh, and then I had to go in and just like finesse them and tweak them, but I edited the, you know, ninety percent of the of the movie. Yeah, Lauren was saying the the final sequence was originally a lot longer. Did you find yourself cutting more stuff out this time through? Oh my god, so much longer. We we were, I was cutting things because every, of course it's so um, that's one of the most divisive criticized elements of part one was how long the runtime is. So the uh, the distributor. For this film, Cineverse, I mean, they were pleading with me to keep it under two hours. And I want to keep it under two hours, too. I want it to be an hour and a half in, in, in a perfect world. But what I what I try and tell people is there's, like, definitely a misconception of these movies being too long. I don't think it's a justifiable criticism to a, to a degree because it's not it's not like your traditional slasher film like if you take the the total runtime of say um the the screen time that jason or freddie is in in a, one of those films they're probably in the movie for like 10 minutes tops yeah. like when you put all their screen time together and the kill scenes are instantaneous mm -hmm. they really i mean the knife comes up it goes down the scene's over like here you have art the clown killing somebody for five minutes and then you have a lead up like the scene in the bar or something with all this foreplay that's another five minute scene you have the cold open with chrissy that honestly if you really wanted to cut this movie down and you said we had to we have to get rid of scenes that you can afford to lose that won't disrupt the narrative like that's a scene you'd want to take out but that's a scene you'd never lose it's one of the ultimate highlights of the movie so it's like you know terrifier is just a very unorthodox sort of way of structuring a slasher and you're inevitably you end up with a longer runtime so but i knew that was going to be an issue regardless because again the script was so big i had all these big art the clown set pieces so as we were getting to the climax i was just tearing pages out of the finale i think i think i took seven pages out of the finale um we actually still did film scenes that i had to just completely cut out of the movie there's a great scene between victoria and little gabby that's really psychological and messed up that we had to cut and but there's probably like six scenes all together throughout the movie that i had to pull from the the finished product i think we could have easily had another two hour and 20 minute movie 25 minute movie so i did my best i couldn't get it quite under two hours it's two hours and five minutes with yeah Fred, so. yeah it's 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 a good pace i think it i think it earns all its time oh thanks yeah. man i'm trying i'm trying i'm trying <laughs> to get them as, <laughs> i'm trying to get them down as much as i can <laughs> yeah uh, speaking of gabby antonella rose did such a good job like another another great casting choice another great actor oh like, my gosh yeah and that's you know you're putting a lot of eggs into into her basket i mean she was i don't know how old she was maybe 11 or mm -hmm. so between 10 and 12 as she is and super, you know, she, by the end of the movie, to throw this child into the climax, which is really brutal, yeah. sadistic, you don't know how that's going to be, how you're going to approach working that way with an actor or how far you can push them. You have to be super delicate, super sensitive with a child. And the only thing I would say to her was really if I needed her, and I do this with everybody, and this is my problem, not a problem, but something I have to face with every actor is pushing them further out of their comfort zone. Because mm -hmm. these movies are all heightened realities and people are really afraid to go far. Like, you know how far Kubrick pushed um, like Shelley Duvall? Her performance is absolutely stunning. I mean, she had to get to that heightened reality, you know, regardless of his methods and what you think about that. I'm just talking about the uh, the finished product. Mm -hmm. I knew that as a kid, I knew that she was on a different level than other screen queens or other final girls. Like, I was like, ooh, like this feels more real. Like, I feel like she's really losing herself and the way she's kind of like hyperventilating. It always struck me. I was like, this is different. This is better. Um, but I mean, you have to just push people because you're in such a heightened reality and you have a killer clown chasing you and demons and this. It's like, you might think you look foolish, but you, you like you're not. It's not reading enough. So I'm always trying to just push people, and not in a nasty way. I mean, literally just asking them. I usually just say, "Yeah, you're you're at about like a seven. I kind of need you to be at a ten here. Is there any way you can raise it up or give me give me more? Like just trust me." And Dave's perfect because Dave out of the gate gives me like a twenty. <laughs> so I know. <laughs> That's what I want. I know how far he can go. And I'm like, nah, well, let's just reel it in. And I'm like, let's just settle here. To, to me, that's perfect. So, but 
it happened a handful of times where I would just have to ask Antonella. I was like, can you just be like a little more, a little more intense? You're, you're, you're crying a little harder. And then she would just go into, she would just go off into the corner and she'd go, okay, okay. And then she'd be alone and you just see tears start streaming. I don't know where she's going. Oh God. And what she's thinking of. And then it's just, all right. Uh, action and then she just crying and screaming and then it's cut and i'm like you're all right is everything and then she's like oh yeah i'm fine and then she starts like dancing in the corner and i'm like <laughs> she's if like, you're awesome <laughs> yeah and, and i'm like he's there now like where is she gonna be in five years what what kind of that is remarkable talent so and that's just that's just you know casting that's directing by casting i try and um you know i don't know that there's that famous uh you know, directing is 90% casting or something like that. I think that's a little generous, but uh, it's definitely, it's definitely up there. And if I could just cast somebody who's just doing a great job and I barely have to get in their way or give them too much direction, I love that. It's one less thing I have to worry about. You're just doing your job, you know, and I'll come in if you need help and just tweak something or give you a little note. But I, I really just try and find the best actors and try and stay out of their way as much as I possibly can. Yeah. Is, is that a conversation you have to have with them during casting of like, hey, in this movie, you, you're going to be pushed to a, a limit. Like, I'm sure now it's it's more expected now that the, the property is more well known. But is it like yeah. something that you kind of have to have an established baseline with of like, oh, you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially when it's uh, someone maybe like uh, Casey Hartnett in part two, who yeah. is we knew was going to be involved in the bedroom scene, and she'd never done anything like this before. And just the extensive amount of makeup she was going to have to go through, too, uh, that, that was a serious conversation. And also... You can't you can't really see how far that person's willing to go until they're in the scenario, until they're in the scene. You know, it's like, how can you possibly tap into that emotion unless you find yourself in the room covered in blood face to face with Arthur Clown? It's kind of hard to push them to that level 10 in the audition, you know, when you just met the person. Yeah. So you kind of got to trust. You kind of got to feel it out and trust that you can probably get them there or they will get there on their own. Um, but yeah, and it's just letting them, it's just being totally honest and upfront with them, even, even telling them what to expect once the movie's out and what you're going to have to, what you may experience and what, how this might change your, your life a little bit. I mean, there's a good chance you will be known for this for quite some time. Are you comfortable with that? Uh, all those kinds of things. So uh, the more we learn as we're making this movie, the more honest and upfront we are with people about every aspect of it. When it came to all the kids, because there are a lot of kids in this movie, like at the mall, when Art Santa Claus, with those kid actors, did you have David talk to them out of character and like establish a rapport? Or did you kind of keep art as art and then just hope that, you know, the kids aren't going to be messed up for life? No, yeah, well, we didn't. <laughs> We didn't try and do anything like malicious to the kids or just like see, try and get a reaction and just have art come out. Because so we we immediately, especially David, immediately disarms all the, the kids and makes them feel as safe and comfortable as possible. But he doesn't even need to. Uh, every time it, you'd be surprised, the kids can't wait to meet him. So like in the mall when he's the mall Santa, yeah. he was makeup and all the kids were already there. And they were all coming up to me saying, hey, where's the clown? Where's the clown? Is the clown here yet? And uh, and, uh, and I, they didn't really know too much about what was going on in the scene. So like spoiler alert. I could say spoiler alert. Yeah, man. I was going to say at this point, if you haven't seen the movie, you know, pause the video, go see it. Because I do want to talk about like what okay. happens in the scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they were coming up to me saying, hey, was this the scene where we like blow up and stuff? And I'm like, I'm like, how do you I'm like, there's no bomb. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, he's just giving you presents. That's it. It's just a silly clown. You know, so I don't give them any of that information. I don't know how they even got that information um yeah because i guess yeah. they wouldn't be there's like an explosion and then you don't see kids like crawling around it's just no, they're gone because now. actually there was no nobody who watched us film that scene in the mall had any idea what happens because we basically filmed up to the moment where the kid opens the present and then we rebuilt that set months later out, outside and we blew it up uh, in, in a parking lot basically so nobody knew you know we were blowing up children um, yeah their parent, their parents knew. They knew the context of the scene. Of course, you had to tell them what was going on. But I, that's that's what it was. So we, the parents had to know. But the parents, I guess, were happy to tell the children what was going on <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> instead of just saying you're going to meet this clown and get presents. Um, but I denied it. I was just like, no, no, no. There's no bomb here. You guys are fine. You guys are fine. Uh, but everybody's usually very. Um, the children love Dave because you've met David, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, you meet him in real life. It's like read it, it's like meeting Roger Rabbit. He's yeah. he's like <laughs> walking cartoon character. So he instantly makes the kids feel very safe and they become his favorite person on set, even if he's in that creepy mega. Yeah, and you establish right off the bat in that opening scene with Chrissy that kids can be killed in this. Uh, again, you do it off screen, so I imagine like the kid actor doesn't necessarily need to be there or you know, exactly. any of that. So uh but I am wondering, you're you're killing kids here, you're blowing them up. And you're doing some religious iconography at the end with yeah. the crown of thorns and everything. Is there anything that is in your mind like too far? Do you have any limits of like something that you're like, no, I would never do that? I don't think any uh, subject is too taboo to tackle. But I think once I'm, if I decide that I am going to tackle it, then I have to be so somewhat sensitive in regards to the execution or making sure that the execution of such a topic is uh, remains tolerable or palatable to the audience because um you know we're in this tricky um we're in this tricky unique situation with terrify where we're so we're known for pushing the boundaries of the gore so it's expected of us to really push the limits um and i love doing that um it's you know that would be disingenuous not to do that so i try and get right up to the line step right over it you know push the boundaries a little bit but while trying to maintain some level of mass appeal because i think if these movies are just gore with nothing else i think that's a and and if that's what they're labeled as i think that's a disservice to the art the clown character because yeah. he really does have he he could appeal to your casual horror movie fan you know like if he is filling that void of a slasher you know uh, like freddy or jason especially freddy because he has this wonderful charm and this sense of humor this dark sense of humor and you can get a lot of laughs out of this character there's a lot of fun to be had with art the clown uh, art the clown he's not just like this one note killer and it's just all about gore like there's so many la layers and there's it's such a beautiful performance it is um, yeah by Dave, by david so i think it would be a shame if uh people too many people were turned off because we went too far in a really distasteful direction so it's a tricky balance i'm not saying i strike that and uh, it's certainly um it, Every, it's yeah so everyone will have a different opinion on whether or not course. you do yeah 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 but it could always be worse and like i'll write <laughs> things and i'll say to myself no no no, you gotta come step back three three steps back yeah that's too far there's even things they they you know david everybody tries to like one-up me on set or throw ideas at me and like oh what if we did this now with the body or something like that i'm like nah it's too distasteful <laughs> i'm like let's stop there uh we're gonna lose people if we do that so there are things that um i wouldn't show um just because i think they're too they're, they're too much. It's, it's trying too hard. It's like being too desperate to shock. Um, sure. But again, it's a matter of taste. People would definitely assume I went way past that line, and, and that's fine. Everybody's line's different, but I, I can go further. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I know that uh, a maybe kind of offhand comment of saying, yes, there will be a Terrifier 4 blew up into Terrifier 4 is confirmed and being worked on. Uh, regardless of where it is right now, there will be another one. We're all happy about that. Terrifier 3 ends on a kind of cliffhanger, so we know there's more to the story. And so we're going to explore the lore and backstory a little more. But just as, before I let you go, I want to see if my understanding of the lore so far... Uh, you don't you don't have to give me details, but you can just tell me if I'm close because I, I, I tried to, you know, I paused it, I rewound it, I, I okay. watched that screener to see if I could understand. So uh, my understanding is that the little girl from Terrifier 2, as we saw her, is a demon who wants to enter our world. She must use a vessel to do so, which is someone who is recently deceased and is very evil. I'm assuming that is art who was a human killer in Terrifier 1 until he died, and that is what brought him back was the need to be this vessel. I think I got all that. And mm -hmm. then Victoria Hayes is a host for the demon. That's why I kind of get a little lost in Terrifier 3. Uh, yeah. if, if it's the demon little girl in Victoria Hayes temporarily. That is that is correct. So Okay. One, so one of the things I didn't really spell out so much in this one is how how sometimes like arts victims if he breaks breaks them like victoria she becomes sort of uh he leaves like a bit of an imprint on them and she becomes susceptible to the evil that brought him back so that's why the pale girl was able to inhabit her so the pale girl in essence takes art the clown's head because what should have happened is sienna's sword would have killed art the clown at the yeah. end of part two but since the 
pale girl is still sort of living in that beyond in between dimensions she could still resurrect art the clown again so she takes his head goes back into her dimension uh possesses victoria that's why he's rebirthed his mm -hmm. head's re and now she's embodying victoria because she was this susceptible vessel that she could inhabit because she's been broken by art the clown and she's inhabitable you know what i mean so so that's that's what's going on there i mean these are tricky things to really spell out yeah. in the movie because nobody would know these details mm -hmm. uh, and, and nobody would just sit there and explain it unless you brought in a character or brought in a journal so i was just trying to give as much information as possible but i knew when i was making this that it was going to have this sort of lynchian narrative um i even said that in uh, when i was trying to do the indiegogo campaign and trying to raise money for part two yeah. uh because I, I love that ambiguity, that mystique, how everything's sort of this nightmarish, you know, dreamscape kind of vibe to it, where you really wouldn't get, nobody would know that information. It's just like these things are happening to them in real time. Like Sienna's experiencing this metamorphosis that's happening to her, like same with Art the Clown. So the only way to really do that is to either bring in a character that just spills the exposition or they find a book that has all of that exposition in it. Um, so it, it's a tricky balance because I want to give all this information to the audience as we're going and giving them these puzzle pieces. So it's just finding the right way to do it where you're not just, just dumping straight exposi exposition at them. There's, there's gotta be more creative ways to sort of get those, you know, those points across. Yeah. I, I was really happy with the amount that we got in Terrifier 3 because at the end of two, uh, Terrifier 2, I was a little confused. Terrifier 3, I was like, oh, cool. There's just enough and there's still more to come that I'm excited yes. for. So I think you did a good job in how much you parsed out for everyone. All right, cool, cool. Yeah. I'm trying, and yeah, I mean, <laughs> there is a, um, there certainly is a master plan, and uh, you will know a lot by the time this is done. And I don't know if that's going to be one movie or two movies, but I knew where this was going to end when I wrote part two. Uh, so it's just a matter of how long it takes me to get there, um, and we'll be getting there sooner than later because there's, I, you know, I just have this fear of the well running dry with these movies and we pack so much into each movie that there's only so many ways to creatively outdo yourself from the last movie and keep ramping up these kill scenes and keep getting these laughs out of Art the Clown, you know, and there's only just the journey with Sienna and Art, it could only go on for so long before it just starts getting stale, so... I, I have a few more things to say, and then I think it's time to maybe check out for a little bit, and then then we'll reassess. We'll see where we are down the line. That's fair. Well, you're doing great so far, and I, I hope everyone's going to see Terrifier 3 in theaters. Uh, independent film, you know, let's, let's make it even more successful than the last one, which was just a, a huge success. And I, I just loved seeing the the mainstream people talk about like because they couldn't deny it they couldn't ignore terrifier 2 from because of where it got they were like oh all right i guess we'll pay some attention to it so good yeah. job doing that man congrats oh, thanks buddy i appreciate it yeah. this was a blast man always a pleasure to talk to you buddy always a pleasure thanks so much